Good morning, friends. Welcome to Wake Up in the Word. I wanted to get something big today, the big Texas cup, because we've got the big subject to conclude chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians with today. It's the resurrection and its greatest hope. So grab a good cup of coffee, the Word of God. Join me today in 1 Corinthians 15. Before we get there, I want to share from uh, one of the commentators two great quotes that I think really exemplify what's going on. You know, we've been having a lot of funerals, it seems like, in our region. And then, of course, last week, the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, and they're getting ready for that going home celebration. What will the funeral of a queen be like? Well, who knows? But you know, it says something. Regardless of whether you're prince or pauper, you're all going to face one certain event, and that is death. We all will come to it, whether we're rich or poor, whether we are at the highest level of societies or if we're homeless on the street, we're all going to face it one day. Thomas Gray wrote, The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all the beauty and all that wealth e'er gave await alike the inevitable hour. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. You know, as far as human power, beauty, wealth, and glory are concerned, the truth applies to Christians as much as any others. But the hope of the Christian is not in such things, which he knows will end at the grave. The hope of the Christian is expressed by the epitaph of Benjamin Franklin, who wrote for himself that which was placed on his grave. It's engraved on his tombstone in the cemetery of Christ Church in Philadelphia. The body of Benjamin Franklin, printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here food for worms. But the work will not be lost, for it will appear once more in a new and more elegant edition, revised and corrected by the author. As he capitalizes the A of author, pointing out his faith in the resurrection promised by the Lord Jesus Christ, and this passage that we're going to be looking at today. You know, it's the longest of the chapters here in First Corinth, uh, in, in all of the book of 1 Corinthians. It's the longest chapter, the one that talks about the gospel and the resurrection. It's one with the most umph to it. It's why we use it so often at funerals. I can't tell you how many times I've read from the passage I'm about to read now, either in the service or at the graveside of someone. It was just last week at Ken Boone's funeral. We heard the same thing being preached from Pastor Curtis Robertson, a dear friend of Ken's, who was able not only to preach from this passage, but then to break out into song at the end of the message where he sang, Soon I will be done with the troubles of this world. Wow, what a powerful message it was and a powerful song. I told someone it literally sent chills up and down my spine, and that's hard for a preacher to say because, you know, we've been to an awful lot of church services and funerals, but it was when the promise of the resurrection was being touted by that pastor in the such, such a beautiful form that it once again touched us in the place where our hope lies, the very heart of the gospel, the promise of the resurrection. Let's read it together. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 50. He writes, What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I'm, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep. Now, that's not talking about the nap you're going to take this afternoon. This kind of sleep is referred to in the scripture as that which happens to those who have died. So he's talking about death when he says, we'll not all fall asleep. But, he writes, we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will all be changed. Now this is the trumpet that he refers to when he writes also to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 about what some would call the rapture of the church when he says the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. This is the same 
the same event he's referencing here to the Corinthian church. In verse 53, he goes on to say, For this corruptible, speaking of our bodies, this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility. This mortal body must be clothed with immortality. And when this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. (laughs) Wow, there it is, my friends. We have in Jesus something that every human being has wished for since the beginning of creation. A way to cheat death. A way to stop it. A way to have victory over it. We've never had that occur in of any natural way, any natural form, even though scientists, doctors have tried for ages to take it away. It's inevitable, my friends. These physical bodies are not made to be permanent. And despite all the surgeries and all the medical procedures you may try to involve yourself in to lengthen your time, you may only add a few years. Even queens die. And yes, even though she had one of the longest reigns ever, Queen Elizabeth couldn't even make it to 100. And for many of us, that seems to be almost like a goal. Well, you know, if I could just live to be 100... You know, a lot of folks that have lived to be a hundred sure didn't have much of a body left when they made it there. Friends, this stuff's not permanent. It's not made to be. But what Paul is saying is one day we will put on that eternal body in that eternal spirit world that God has prepared for us, one that will be just as physical as the one we're in now, but it'll be different in that it will not be corruptible. It will not deteriorate and fall apart like the bodies we have right now. That's the promise. The promise that the sting of death will be gone. No more victory of death over us. Instead, you and I will experience something that we have longed for since we first accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That wonderful, immortal promise fulfilled from John 3.16. Because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not have to perish, experience this death, but would have everlasting life. Oh, it's appointed unto man once to die, it says in Hebrews, but after this is the judgment. And if our sins have been placed under the precious blood of Calvary and our sins were judged at the cross, then there awaits for us the most beautiful and wonderful eternity, the eternity that's being promised right here in the Word of God. That's why the gospel that we saw at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15 is so important. Yes, yes, Jesus Christ lived for us, died, was buried, and he rose again, sits today at the right hand of God the Father. And that promise today, my friend, is what you and I count on for our hope our eternity. It's why we could leave that funeral the other day as we have for the funerals of thousands of believers in Christ with the hope in our hearts that one day we'll see our loved ones again. That one day we'll experience not just from afar and seeing through a glass darkly as Paul says, but one day face to face our precious Savior who died for us and gave us this hope. That's why he can conclude 1 Corinthians 15 with these words. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's the message for you this morning, my friends. What you're doing for the Lord Jesus is not in vain. It makes a difference for all eternity. Don't you ever forget it. Because the hope that is ours in Christ Jesus allows us to face times even when we have lost a loved one. And even if it's sudden, if it's unexpected, it allows us to do what Paul says in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. We get to grieve, but in a different way. 
we don't grieve like those who have no hope because we have the ultimate hope, the blessed hope of our Lord Jesus Christ, who at his soon appearing will raise those who have died and gone before us, but he will also, it says at that last trump, change us in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and soon and suddenly we will all be like him. What a beautiful promise to start the day with. So I hope you have a great day in the Lord, and let's do this again tomorrow as we'll start in a new chapter in 1 Corinthians uh, as this beautiful book continues to teach us how to help the church be healed from its brokenness. Thanks for joining me. Invite a friend, and let's do this again tomorrow right here as we wake up in God's Word.